it's a real treat to have J. Courtney Sullivan here with us today to discuss her new novel, Saints for All Occasions. In this well-crafted story, we follow the lives of Nora and Teresa Flynn, um, sisters with secrets between them uh, that both distance them from each other and also bind them together. After years of estrangement, duty to family calls and forces the sisters to reestablish their relationship. Uh, Ron Charles of the Washington Post said of the book uh, in his rave review, this year's best book about family, elegant, captivating, a quiet masterpiece. Saints for All Occasions is so unassuming that its artistry looks practically invisible. In a simple style that never commits a flutter of extravagance, Sullivan draws us into the lives of the Rafferty's and in the rare miracle of fiction makes us care about them like they were our own family. To read this engrossing novel is to become invested in these entirely resilient and impossibly fragile people. It is a story that draws us deep into the essential qualities of motherhood and the compensation of faith. J. Courtney Sullivan is the author of three other novels, including Commencement, Maine, and The Engagements, all New York Times bestsellers. In 2011, her, no her novel Maine uh, was named Time Magazine's Best Book of the Year. The Engagements was an Irish Times Best Book of the Year and has been translated into 17 languages. Apart from these novels, she's also contributed to many uh, publications, including the Chicago Tribune, the New York Times Book Review, and Elle, among others. Courtney will be in conversation today with Taylor Burney, one of our favorite interlocutors at the store here, mm -hmm. um, has been many times. Taylor is the events manager at our local NPR station, WAMU. Today's conversation is part of the WAMU book series we've had featured in the store here, uh, not only with Taylor, um, but also with other staff and presenters at WAMU. Um, so please join me in welcoming J. Courtney Sullivan and Taylor Burney to call the Thank course. you. Candace, thank you so much for the kind welcome back. It's so good to be here. Um, and Courtney and I are gonna talk for a little while, but I wanna encourage you all to think of your own questions. We'll have time for that towards the end. There are two microphones. There's one over there and one over there. Make sure you go to the microphones. As Candace mentioned, they're recording this, so we'll wanna be sure to hear what you have to say. Um, and I do very briefly wanna say, it is great to be back at PMP. We at WMU have a lot in common with our local independent bookstores. Um, we're all about fostering curiosity and hosting great conversations and really engaging with the community, which is why we're here today. Um, but remember, we're there for you 24-7, 365 at 88.5 on your FM dial as well. <laughs> um, and you know, we know that a lot of people in this region are avid readers and so are our staff. I know there's a few folks here today. Um, raise your hands if you work at WMU, hello. Um, we'd be happy to sit and chat with you afterwards while Courtney's signing books. And if you're uh, on social media, check out the WMU Books hashtag. But without further ado, Courtney, welcome back to DC. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah. I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about this novel. I really loved it. Um, and for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet, mm. can you tell us a little bit about the Rafferty's, um, not just in terms of where they are at, at the current moment, but mm. also a little bit about their background and heritage, because the novel really does go back and forth in time. Yes. So um, the novel uh, begins with these two sisters, Nora and Teresa, who immigrate from Milltown, Malbay, Ireland to Boston in 1958. Uh, Milltown, Malbay is this tiny town in the west of Ireland where my great grandmother was born, actually. So there's um, a bit of autobiography in the story. Um, and in Boston, uh, these two sisters, very young, uh, one is 17, one is 21, they're kind of set on this path. One ends up the mother of four children, and one ends up a cloistered Catholic nun. And um, they also end up estranged from one another for over 30 years. And in the present day of the book, you kind of find out why that is, what happened. Uh, they're coming back together because of a family wake. And uh, the book is told from the point of view of both sisters as well as Nora's surviving adult children. Nora, the matriarch of the family in sort of modern times, mm -hmm. is really at the center of this family in many ways. And she fascinated me because she had to deal with this real lack of autonomy when she was young. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how that is something that she has to cope with and how her ways of coping with that shape who she becomes as an adult? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, Nora is someone who 
ultimately really wants to exert control over all things. And when her children are very, very young, um, it might be a little easier now that they're 40, 45 years old. It's become a little bit trickier. Um, she, as a young woman, is very much the sort of typical older sister uh, guiding her younger sister through life. And her younger sister is often a headache to her. Um, but also they have this relationship where each of them is kind of the half of a whole. And so Teresa's very vibrant, very outspoken, very outgoing. Nora's incredibly sort of shy and withdrawn. Um, and when they separate, they kind of each have to build parts of the other onto themselves in a weird way. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. And as you mentioned, they are immigrants to the US. And you know, earlier this year, you wrote a great piece for the New York Times about being Irish American, sort of that ancestry and that fact that it's a tradition that really ce celebrates immigration at a time when that's something that's really come under fire here in the US yeah. in a lot of ways. Um, and I wonder if this book ended up being political when it was done and sort of published in a way that you did not at all anticipate as you were writing it. Oh, totally. I think, unfortunately, that's the case. Yeah. Um, when I was writing the book, it felt to me like a very old fashioned kind of family story, which I think it is in many ways. Um, but certainly just this idea that uh, in part, it's a book about how this family becomes American. Nora's children are raised as Americans, but not by Americans. And that's sort of true of this whole generation of the family. Um, and what it looks like for various members of the family who've come from Ireland, uh, how they view li life in America. Some of them want to stay forever. Some of them don't. Some of them adapt very well. Some of them don't ever want to talk to anyone who isn't Irish Catholic, and they really don't. Um, I think it did start to feel very political in our new climate because for most of us, we are only here because of someone else's choice to come over at some earlier point. Um, in my case, my grandmother, great grandmother, came at 17 years old. And from Ireland, so many of the women, so many of the people who came were women traveling alone, um, very young women in most cases. and. I think the other kind of political part of the book that I didn't intend to be political, but again, unfortunately, has sort of become so, is in a lot of ways, it's a book about kind of women's bodies and how much control they have over them and what that does for the rest of their lives, what that means for the rest of their lives. Um, certainly, uh, when Teresa um, becomes pregnant in the 1950s, it's a very different situation than it is for further generations of this family dealing with that kind of thing because of just what she knows about her own body and the options that are available to her in that time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as Candace mentioned, motherhood's a really strong theme in the novel. And I want to talk a little bit about that a little later on yes. as well. But you know, it's funny, I really related to this book and to Maine as well in a visceral way because I come from a really similar background. I'm New England roots, really culturally Irish Catholic. Um, and the more I'm away, the more I feel like there's sort of this unique hyper concentration and intensity to that in, in that region in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like I know these people. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate when Nora's like, the only thing I like about America is Brigham's vanilla ice cream. Um, you know, like that's all she's interested in. And her husband does very sweetly make sure there's always some in the freezer. Yes, for sure. Um, <laughs> which is great. But you know, I do wonder, you mentioned a little bit about this already, but I wonder how much the Rafferty's in this novel and the Kelleher's in Maine, you know, spring maybe not necessarily from your own family, but from that very intense sort of cultural experience that you had growing up as well. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I uh, grew up in a family and, and also a neighborhood and a town where everyone was Irish Catholic. I think I was probably 10 before I met an Italian person, you know, let alone anybody more exotic than that. So um, I grew up in a family where um, the Irish tradition was so celebrated to a point that my husband is from Iowa and he finds it all extremely ridiculous that we are like this, but you know, like the corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day and everyone listening to the Clancy brothers and we all did Irish step dancing lessons and all of that. So, um, but the generation that actually came from Ireland, and this was true in my family and in other families I knew, um, didn't really want to talk about Ireland in that way and didn't want to celebrate it to quite the same extent. 
um, I think there was a lot of pain there, and as a result, it just didn't get talked about very much. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there's a little repression in the Irish Catholic community. I've heard rumors about that. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, I've, I've heard tell that that's yeah. a thing that can happen. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to talk about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, uh, Nora's sister, Teresa, does become a nun, mm -hmm. ultimately. And you know that is certainly something that was informed by some people you knew and, and some experiences. I, could, I wonder if you could read a passage for us from yes. chapter four that yeah. really captures her early interest in the Catholic faith, because faith runs very strongly mm -hmm. through the course of this novel. Yes. Where do you think I should go to? Here, do you want to go to the break? Yeah. Yeah. When Teresa Flynn was a child of seven, she mistook the lives of the saints with its green leather cover and golden lettering for a book of fairy stories. She spotted the thick volume on a high shelf in her grandmother's room and read it straight away. She fell in love with Saint Cecilia, a noblewoman who became the patron saint of musicians, among the most famous of the Roman martyrs. In the year 180, she was stabbed three times in the neck with a sword, but lived for three more days, time enough to ask the Pope to convert her home into a church. Teresa loved Saint Seraphia, a devout orphan who refused to marry, sold all her possessions, and gave the money to the poor, then sold herself into slavery, eventually converting her master. When they threw her into the fire for her faith, she would not burn. Teresa loved St. Catherine, a French nun in the 19th century who had a vision of the Virgin Mary, telling her, God wishes to charge you with a mission. You will be contradicted, but do not fear. You will have the grace to do what is necessary. Tell your spiritual director all that passes within you. Times are evil in France and in the world. How often had Teresa read those words to her uninterested family? Again and again, she told them how St. Catherine woke one night and heard the voice of a child calling her to a chapel. There, the Virgin presented herself in an oval of light, standing upon a globe surrounded by stars. She instructed St. Catherine to ensure that the image was placed on medallions that would bring good graces to all who wore them. These became the miraculous medals, the oval trinkets carried or stowed in a drawer by every woman they knew. Teresa was awake many nights thinking about St. Catherine's incorruptible body, so holy that it never decomposed after her death. She paid no attention to the male saints. She cared only for the women, the way most girls loved the princess in a story and hardly noticed the prince. As she read, Teresa saw how many of these brave and righteous women had been nuns. An older cousin of hers, Mary Dolan, was a nurse with the Sisters of Mercy in Dublin. Teresa knew that under Mary's wimple lay a mass of thick brown curls, which were somehow more beautiful to her in their invisibility than anything her eyes could behold. Mary came home only once for her sister Annabelle's funeral. Teresa just gazed at her as if she were a film star. I'm going to be a nun too one day, she said. As she grew up, she noted that most of the nuns she met were nothing like the ones in her stories. The nuns at the convent school had foul breath and saggy arms. They would sooner sprout wings than endure flames or stab wounds in the name of devotion. When Sister Florence thwacked Teresa across the head with a rolled up copy of the Clare Champion for talking in class, there was nothing saintly in it. Magdalen, Magdalen nuns ran the orphanage in Clunahana. Their father had threatened to send them all there on some occasion or another, and so from a young age, Teresa was terrified of the place. Later, she read about the scandals throughout history, about the ancient aristocrats who moved their daughters into the convent only because it was a more affordable alternative to a dowry, about poor Archangela forced into monasticism like many others in the 17th century because she was disabled, about the Medici's and the lay nuns called skivvies who were made to be servants to the dowried nuns. But it was none of this that deterred her, only that at some point, Teresa discovered boys. She tucked her dream then away as if it were any other childish thing, a stuffed toy or a soft baby blanket designed to be cherished and then forgotten.
Thank you so much for reading that. I, Thank you. I love that passage because it points up the power of stories, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so much of our faith is tied to these tales that we're told that have been handed down through generations. Um, and I've heard that you really love to do research. So I wonder how much time you spent on saints and how much you had to maybe pull yourself back because I imagine once you start going down that rabbit hole, it's endlessly fascinating, right? <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, yeah, I do love to do research. I used to be a researcher at the New York Times when I was writing my first novel, and I always dreamed of just being able to write fiction and not have to do any research anymore. And then the second I quit my job, I was like, oh, but I actually love doing research. And so all of my novels have a great deal of research in them. Um, and certainly there is this, this thing of like, not drowning in your own research and not boring your reader to tears with your research. Um, the saints thing, you know, I think there is a certain kind of um, Catholic child, maybe particularly a girl, who is very drawn to these stories and there is something kind of fairy tale-ish about them in a way. Um, they have really gruesome elements, they have really beautiful elements, and certainly um, in this part of Ireland in particular, when I asked people, did you have books growing up? Because at first I had Teresa reading all these books as a child, but um, then they said no. The only book that really any of us would have would be the Bible and maybe the lives of the saints. And so I could really see her kind of learning about storytelling, as many Catholics do, through both of those and not much else. That's really interesting. Um, Candace mentioned it before, but in his review, which can only be described as glowing, Ron Charles um, from The yes. Post said that, quote, the alternating chapters about Teresa feel refreshingly anachronistic, thoroughly at odds with our modern requirement that religious characters in literary fiction suffer either madness or disillusionment. Without a breath of sentimentality, Sullivan dares to imagine the entwined trials and riches to be found in cloistered devotion. Um, because Teresa does, in fact, become a nun after she has some run-ins with boys. Um, <laughs> yes. And I wonder if making religion such a central part of this novel gave you any pause at all in terms of getting it quote-unquote right. Yeah. Um, because I think Ron really hits on something with that idea that, you know, often in literature, religion is, you know, a passing quirk or a sort of device for a novelist, not necessarily something that's treated in a really thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first off, as if any of you cannot tell, I am eight months pregnant, and um, we have definitely decided after that review to name the baby Ron Charles, so <laughs> that's good. Um, second of all, um, you know, I've, I am very much a, a lapsed Catholic, um, but it's been interesting with people who've read this book uh, early and come to events um, in the past couple of weeks, many of them have said that they were surprised to hear that. They would actually have thought I was religious, which sort of made me happy in a way, because um, I come from a very Catholic family, and I have um, a lot of sort of issues with the church, but I also have a lot of respect for it, and I, I see kind of what it does, the roles it plays for better and for worse in the lives of a lot of people in, in my own world. Um, and I think within the context of this book, I'm always interested in kind of how different people experience one event or one thing in their lives. And in this family, you have you know a range of people from uh, a devout cloistered nun to completely lapsed, um, bitter non-believers in the next generation. And I think it reflects a lot of sort of real families, Catholic families, where there's just such a range, also within gener well, from one generation to the next, this notion of kind of one generation where almost every decision they make is dictated by the church. And in the next generation, it's just not quite as powerful a hold. Yet it is still there. You know, I think when you're raised Catholic, it just stays in you in ways that you may or may not want it to. Um, I mean, I feel like I... You know, every time an ambulance goes by me in the street with a siren on, I'll say a Hail Mary in my head. It's just this, like, muscle memory. And the guilt, you know, never leaves you, of course. That's the other part of it. Yeah, there's a lot of it that's sort of cultural. Even, yes. even if, you know, similarly, I'm, I'm from a very Catholic family, but mm -hmm. lots of lapsed 
issue, and lots of issues over the course of the years with the church in um, yeah. very personal ways. But yeah. I think there is something about it that is just very cultural, yeah. that even if they're not sort of consciously teaching you that this is something you do because of your faith, it's just what you do. Yeah, um, yes, it's part exactly. of who you are in, exactly. in some really substantial ways. Um, and I was so interested, right around the same time your book hit shelves, there was this piece in New York Magazine with the headline, why are we so obsessed with nuns right now? <laughs> um, and I wonder <laughs> if you think, in fact, we are obsessed with nuns right now, and what you make of that, if so. Are you guys obsessed with nuns right now? I'm always obsessed with nuns. Um, I think, uh, you know, as, well, particularly I think the nuns who they're referring to and the nuns who are having a moment are um, are cloistered nuns. And part of it is that like we're living in this ever more connected world where every second you have to be on Facebook, Instagram, email, your phone. And there's actually now this like sort of fantasy element to going off to an abbey where you're just totally disconnected. Honestly, I was reading some of the passages with Teresa in the cloistered abbey and I was like, this sounds really great. Yeah, like, it sounds, sounds wonderful. It's like just this great annoying. retreat, you know? Yeah. yeah, you can go to Canyon Ranch or just become a nun. Um, just kidding. Um, but uh, for my own, in my own case, um, I, you know, I did meet these nuns in real life. Um, one of my aunts a few years ago, when I was sort of thinking about what to write next, she kept saying, I have a great idea for you. I know exactly what you should write. And generally, I'm sure there are other writers in this room. I know there are. Usually when someone tells you, I know exactly what you should write, it means that's going to be a terrible idea and you're not going to want to write it. And so my aunt said, you should write a book about nuns. That would be great. And I'm thinking, ooh, I don't want to write about nuns, you know? Um, but actually, she turned out to be quite right because she also told me, you know, at the very least, you've got to meet Mother Lucia, who is a family friend, who is a cloistered nun, who in true Irish Catholic family form I had never heard of before, but she had gone into the cloister before I was born. And my aunt kept saying, I just have this feeling that you'll love each other and you'll really connect and have so much in common. And I'm thinking, what will I have in common with a woman who's been a cloistered nun for 40 years? But actually, we started corresponding and it was true. I just loved her right from the beginning. And I started going to her abbey, which is about two hours from where I live, um, for what's called a parlor, where you'd have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the nun through, um, basically through a screen, and you're each in different rooms. And then um, I just learned that she was just a fascinating woman. You know, I think when you are when you grow up Catholic, you kind of imagine nuns like emerge fully formed and just are born nuns, but actually, no, they all have these fascinating backstories. And the abbey where she lives in particular, it's called the Abbey of Regina Laudis in Connecticut. Um, the nuns there have just had these extraordinary lives. They all have very rich backgrounds. So um, they're you know, women who've worked in politics, women who've been on Wall Street. Uh, their most famous nun is probably Dolores Hart, who uh, was an actress in films with Elvis in the 50s and decided to give up this big film contract to join the Abbey. So after I went there for several parlors, and then they invited me to come and stay for a week and work with them on their farm, um, I was just totally hooked by nuns. So nuns are definitely having a moment in my world. I don't know about anybody else's. Well, I think it, it's so interesting because I, I did read the piece and it, it sort of posited that what you just pointed up, that there's this sort of intimidating thing that happens when you see a habit and you're like, okay, I know, I know that. I know what that is. Yeah. Um, it's sort of this very symbolic thing and you often ignore the person who's wearing it. Yeah. Um, and this idea that there are so many projects now that are showing the actual person yeah. under the habit or the fact that you know so many nuns don't even wear them anymore um, yeah. was sort of what they were tapping into. So I think they are having a moment and this book is a great example of it. Yeah, the habit is like a uniform, you know, and so it's like it does something for any, well, maybe some people feel neutral about it, but I think most people, it's kind of like a police officer maybe, you know, you see someone and what does that do? Does it make you feel safe? Does it make you feel afraid? Um, the first time I went to the Abbey, every time I turned a corner, I would jump and be like, oh my God, a nun, a nun, ah! <laughs> but then as things evolved, I started to see them in a very different way. Just talking about them makes me set up straight. <laughs> um, so, you know, I will say every family, of course, has complexities and, and interesting dynamics. And fa what fascinates me is sibling dynamics. Mm. And, you know, in this novel, Nora and Teresa have become estranged. And then in the next generation, you, you've sort of hinted at this already. There's this phenomena that I've observed in my own family, though not experienced myself, where it's like, 
these people grew up in completely different households. Like, how are they siblings? Yeah. Um, and I wonder what you think Patrick and John and Bridget and Brian have in common, aside from their parents. Oh, that's good. I was going to say their parents, but then you said aside from their parents, and now I'm completely stumped. That, that was um, no, it's interesting because there are four children in Nora's family, and they almost form kind of teams of two, I guess you would say. So even though um, Bridget and John are quite different, um, he is like a rising politico in Boston. Um, he's decided to be a Republican, which the family doesn't love, but he wasn't really getting anywhere as a Democrat, so he decided to become a Republican. Um, his sister, Bridget, is a lesbian in Brooklyn who runs an animal shelter, and they're very different, but they're very, very close, and they've always have been, even though their relationship is kind of hot and cold. Um, Patrick and Brian are their own thing. Um, they're the oldest and youngest child, and they're divided by, I think, 15 years. And so um, they have this very loving relationship, but they also have stayed very close to home. They want to stay in Dorchester, stay close to their roots. They see the other ones as kind of these sellouts, I guess you could say. Um, and I think there's something about, you know, I love novels that to some degree uh, are interested in social class and sort of how that shapes a family. And in this book, um, as in many real families, you have siblings who all exist in different social classes. And that's kind of interesting when they all come back together and, and they are raised by this woman at such different ages in her life. Um, and so the oldest kids see Nora as incredibly strict. And Brian, the baby, you know, thinks she's like the most lax and loving mother on the planet. So they've all had a really a different time of it with her. Yeah, it's, it is really an interesting dynamic. And as you said, there's sort of like this home and away team that form among the siblings <laughs> as they yes, grow up. And yeah. they, there are some really dramatic differences in their socioeconomic you know, status and mm -hmm. and as you mentioned, I think those memories that they have of Nora are pretty different. Yeah. Um, as how they grew up. And and as you mentioned, the family's brought back together by an untimely death. And there's this undercurrent of tension that really f fuels their their sort of collision, mm. if you will, at this wake. Um, and it's really underpinned by all these secrets, yeah. right? And I was counting, there are at least three different kinds of secrets. There's the shared secret that really drives Nora and Teresa apart for so many years. There's another secret that's between two of the brothers, mm. between uh, John and Patrick, that is very well-intentioned action that one of them takes yeah. that the other just never knows about and interprets in a completely different way yeah. that really shapes how they get along or don't. Yeah. Um, and then there's the open secret of Bridget's sexuality, which brings her closer to some of her siblings, but is like this undiscussed thing that's simmering between her and her mother. Yeah. Um, and I loved how these secrets played out to me as a reader. Um, because you really do a great job of sort of revealing bits of information over the course of the novel and revealing it to some of the other characters at different points or not. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how that was for you as a writer to decide when to disclose and what to disclose, not just to us, the readers, but to the other characters in the novel. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, in a lot of ways, I think this is a book about openness versus closedness and this sort of sense of, um, our world, I think, is sort of an ever-opening world where we're talking about things we never talked about before, like sexuality. And the internet, for all its evils, has also allowed these sort of communities to form. And people can kind of find their own people. And that's sort of amazing. Um, but I was thinking about, well, what happens when you come from a very closed off, sort of repressed family, and that that family stays that way in this ever-expandingly open world? What does that look like? Um, I think, yeah, secrets are such a powerful thing in this family. Um, oftentimes, the sort of keeping of the secret is worth more, especially to Nora, than almost anything. And her sister, who goes into the cloister, who you might think might be the opposite way, ends up feeling that it's always kind of the keeping of the secret that devastates a person, not the secret itself, and that it's better to be out in the open with it all. Um, whereas Nora feels like that's ridiculous, and she has a lot more to lose from this, and she wants to keep everything kind of bottled. And there's something about, the, as you mentioned, the sort of open and the closed, right? Because yeah. I think there is this sense that Nora has that if if people find out yeah. what's sort of gone on, that then what, right? And I think it is that sense of imagining what's the worst that could happen, right? Um, and and I think you know it is so interesting that for Teresa, it is um, 
you know, that she is removed from this society where something theoretically bad could happen, um, yeah. but really has a better understanding of what it's doing to you on the inside. Exactly, yeah. And I think, you know, so Nora, as you said, Nora's daughter is gay. And she, um, when I was writing this character, I was trying to sort of figure out, because she's in her 40s, so, um, you know, she's someone who I think 10 or 15 years earlier didn't even think that these options were, would be available to her. She didn't think she'd be in the relationship she's in. She didn't think she'd be on the cusp of becoming a parent. And now that these things are happening for her, she realizes she can't just show up at Christmas with a baby and be like, I don't know where the, whose baby this is, but I'm just carrying him around. So she has to really address it with her mother. And I was um, looking, uh, I was reading online in some like message board or something about people's experiences of coming out to their parents. And one thing that kept coming up again and again was this story about people saying, I told my parents, I came out to them, I, I got brave, I did the thing, and then they just pretended that it never happened for years. And I thought, oh, that's exactly what Nora would do. She wouldn't have some huge reaction, she would just not wanna know it and therefore not know it. Um, so it comes to ridiculous levels because now this woman's 45 and she's bringing her partner home with her and Nora's like, oh, her roommate is here, great. Um, yeah. You know, and, I, and this really, I think, still does happen even though it feels like we are evolving on these issues so much. Well, I think there's the secret that you almost keep from yourself in a weird way, right? It's like yeah. she just doesn't want to acknowledge it, so she just perpetuates this uh, other idea that like she's going to get back together with Mikey down the street. Right, who Eventually, she dated at 15 right, for and, three months. Like, they're know, probably meant to be together. Probably. <laughs> um, and I do want to ask about motherhood, because the Rafferty family is one where mothers are made in lots of different ways. You know, Nora has four kids, and her son John and his wife adopt a child from overseas. Mm -hmm. um, and you just mentioned Bridget and her girlfriend are talking about going through IVF using a sperm donor. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've noted, you are expecting yourself. <laughs> yes. um, and I wonder if writing this novel change the way that you think about motherhood, either for yourself or just in the broader scheme of things. Yeah. As we sort of look at that culturally, because it's... Yeah. Yeah. I think when you, you know, start writing a novel, usually um, it's because you have some sort of question in mind, you know, and you kind of want to explore all the different angles of that particular issue. Um, so certainly when I started writing this, I was thinking a lot about, and this was four years ago, I was thinking a lot about motherhood and sort of how it comes to be, how what a mother even is, like, you know, and in, within this book, I think, yes, there are so many, there are biological mothers, there are adoptive mothers, there are mothers who um, don't raise their children. Um, there are, even within the context of a convent, I think a lot of these women, um, the nuns I interviewed in real life, you know, they said that this was often the final kind of struggle for someone um, because it does take them seven to 10 years to say their final vows. So a lot of times they wanted to stay, but the very last boundary was, but I won't be able to be a mother. Um, and, you know, but actually they do end up mothering one another in these other ways that are kind of amazing. So I think um, in the beginning, it was just a question of kind of like, what is motherhood? Wh what determines whether it's successful or not? And the fact that we're moving into a world where there's a lot of ways to be a mother. Um, and also I think this idea that um, within every generation for different reasons, there are women who don't raise the children that they give birth to. And Teresa um, gives birth, this isn't really giving much away, but she gives birth in a home for unwed mothers in Boston, which was a real place. And this is yet another way I think that the internet, I don't know why I'm like this uh, champion of the internet today, but uh, another way in which the internet has been this really beautiful thing. This particular uh, home for unwed mothers uh, not only were all of the records sealed, of course, but they also, of course, all burned in a fire. Why do they always all burn in a fire? But they, this, they say this truly did happen. Um, and so no one who gave birth there or was born there really had a chance of finding their person until just a few years ago when these message boards started springing up and people would say, I was born in this hospital on this date or I gave birth to a baby boy in this hospital on this date. And amazingly, you see these connections being made and people finding their families. And that's just such an incredible thing that couldn't have happened even a few years ago. 
it really is incredible, and it reminds me of um, the girls who went away. I don't know if you read that. Yes. In, in preparing to write, those are just prior to, but it is so interesting that there was this, especially I think that particular generation of women who had that experience and didn't have a lot of choice in the matter, right? And whose children are now adults and and maybe looking for them. And as you mentioned, technology has sort of opened that up in a whole yeah. new way. Yeah, and I think you know between World War II and the invention of the birth control pill, there were a lot of women who gave birth in these these places and they were all very young too. I think a big part of this book is what are these huge choices that you're forced to make as a very young person and what are the repercussions that they have in your life over the next you know several decades? Um, there was something I read on one of these, these message boards that I put into the book where uh, a woman said she remembered asking one of these nuns, because of course the unwed mother's homes were mostly run by nuns too, different kind of nun, I guess, um, in a lot of cases. But that she said she remembered asking a nun, how will I tell my future husband about this experience? And the answer was just never tell your future husband about this experience, which is so awful, you know, so again, the repression. Right, and setting up <laughs> that lifetime of secrets. Um, so. Yes. Think of your questions that you might have. Head towards the microphones. I have one more question I want to ask, and then we'll turn it over to you guys. Um, but you know, we are sitting here in D.C., and I would be remiss if we didn't pick back up on the fact that you said one of the brothers, John, becomes this politico in Massachusetts. Mm. Um, and I know that you did a lot of research on the landscape up there, actually through a mutual friend of ours, yes. um, Connor, because Massachusetts really is just one teeny tiny town. Um, and, <laughs> and of course, our mutual friend would be named Connor. Of course. Um, I wonder if as people are starting to read the novel more and you're starting to have conversations with them about it, if the sort of political divide that crops up within the family, because as you mentioned, John becomes sort of this operative for the Republicans in Massachusetts and, yeah. and the rest of the family is not necessarily in that camp. I yeah. wonder if that divide is something that you find readers are finding especially relatable at this particular moment. Yeah, I think so. You know, I think right after the election happened, um, it was funny, I was in, in some sort of like group email with uh, probably like 30 women who all work in the media in some way or another. And someone was saying like, oh, I wish I could have met one of these Trump supporters so I could have understood them. And I was thinking like, just come to my house for Thanksgiving, you'll understand everything. Um, but I think, you know, again, with, within, within families, you have people of different socioeconomic, you know, backgrounds. You also have in a lot of families, including my own, people of very different political persuasions. And that, I think, in the last several months has been coming to a head in a way that maybe it never has before in a lot of families. So certainly that's something in this book that I didn't think was going to be relevant and I wish wasn't relevant, but it is. <laughs> and it does sort of mimic, I mean, you know, it, I think in Massachusetts, which people perceive as being so staunchly democratic, there really has been a dramatic shift in the last maybe two decades yes. towards there being more of a Republican population there. And yes. it was just so interesting because it did sort of mirror what happened with Romney. And, um, yep. you know, I think a lot of families there might be reckoning with this, maybe not for the first time, but in a new way now yes. versus what they were dealing with maybe two decades ago. Yeah. My most conservative, most Catholic uh, Fox News watching relative, one of my uncles, um, read the book in like 24 hours and he loved it. And he's like, I love everything about it except that character, John, um, the right wing guy. And uh, he said I had given John all of his bad jokes to say and then they always fell flat and nobody laughed. So he's like a little annoyed about that. But I like that he liked the book anyway. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, as mentioned, microphones here and here. If you guys have questions, I will ask though too, how, when you write something that is relatively close to your own family, mm. is there this moment, um, and I heard you speak a little bit yesterday at, at Gaithersburg about um, the reluctance in sending the book to your friend who's a nun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there this like moment where you're sort of sitting there with bated breath and going, oh God, what are they gonna say? You know, it's funny because in general, I think when you fear that someone's going to see themselves in a character, they almost never do. Um, and when you weren't intending to write about someone, they often insist that you were writing about them. Um, somebody was joking and saying, in this case, it's going to be hard to send the book to your friend and say, it's not about you, it's about another cloistered nun I'm friends with, um, which is probably true. But um, yeah, you know, when... when uh, my first novel commencement when I was on tour for that book and I was writing Maine, which was about this big Irish Catholic Boston family, um, 
my whole family went out for dinner one night after a reading I gave in Boston. And there were like 25 people around this huge table. And one of my uncles, who's not usually the most expressive man in the world, stood up and he said, you know, we're just so proud of you. We love you so much. And we have to get this out now because when your next book, Maine, is published, none of us will ever be speaking to you again. <laughs> Uh, but no one made good on that threat, so they're all actually extremely lovely about letting me write That's these really things. <laughs> That's the best case scenario, right? It is. Um, anybody have questions out in the audience? Promise the microphone will not bite you. I've never seen it happen yet. Uh, thank you very much. Could you uh, talk a little bit about your journey as a writer? some of your early influences, favorite books, whatever? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I think that for I want to say every writer, but I'm sure there's always an exception. But I would imagine that for most every writer, um, and myself very much included, you begin as a reader. And I definitely grew up in a house with a lot of books. My father was a huge reader. And so um, books were just something I loved so much. I loved reading. I loved, I mean, the, the books I think of most from childhood are like Beverly Cleary's books in particular. I just loved Ramona so much. I thought I was Ramona. I still kind of think I am. Um, I loved Anne of Green Gables. I loved the Laura Ingalls Wilder books. And there was just something about like the physical book itself too. I think when you're a kid, just having them around you. And um, reading stories made me want to write my own stories. And so I did. I wrote a lot of short stories. I wrote a lot of plays that were not short. They were extremely long. And uh, I said this in Gaithersburg yesterday, but uh, several years ago, I found that all of my plays still existed on VHS tape. But unfortunately, my brilliant dialogue is mostly drowned out by the voices of my mother and other mothers saying things like, when will this play end? <laughs> and like, I need to get a chicken in the oven. Like, let's wrap this up, Courtney. Um, so those were my, my best early critics. But um, I always kept writing. And actually, it was when I was in fourth grade, a writer came to my class and spoke about her life and what she did. And it was kind of the first time that it dawned on me that this was a career that you could have. And from then on, I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, so it wasn't exactly a direct line from fourth grade to right here, but kind of. <laughs> a few bumps along the way. Quick question about um, your experience with talking with the nuns. If you were to put the sort of cultural differences um, aside or even historical perspective or <laughs> type of nun, you just put all that over to one side and you just thought about uh, what you thought about their belief system and their faith. Mm. I wondered what you thought and sort of did it have any impact on you? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. Um, you know, like spiritually, religiously, no, it didn't transform me to be around them. But I, I do think there's something really powerful about their way of life, which is that they are, they are contemplatives. Um, they really believe in the power of prayer. And I, I would say I don't not believe in the power of prayer. Is that a way to say it? Um, I, I find what they do to be very powerful. Um, and I also, you know, in the last several years while I was writing this book, the other sort of nun, the more like a working nun who uh, works with people, they've, they've had a really interesting path as well. And a lot of them have been the ones to kind of speak out and say, you know, we are actually working with the poor every day, so we know that people need access to health care, to birth control, to all of this. And to me, they are just such heroes. I think that's incredible. So um, I think that the work that both kinds of nuns do, to me, is very compelling. Um, spiritually, I don't think it changed me, but I, I have so much respect for them in that way. And that was probably the hardest part of this book to write, because um, it's very appealing to write about the farm and about the nuns and about their amazing backstories, but to write your way into a very faithful person when you yourself are not necessarily religious, that was, that was hard. That was probably the hardest thing I've had to do. So Courtney, you've written so often about so many different types of Irish Catholic families and characters. You've written the gamut, and I'm wondering, you have so many readers now who expect novels from you. Do you feel a pressure to continue writing about Irish Catholic families, or do you, mm. would you like to explore something else in future books? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think you know I've written two books that are like straight up Irish Catholic family novels, and I've written two books that have Irish Catholic 
characters in them. Um, when I was writing my third novel, the engagements, I said, I'm not gonna have any Irish Catholics in this book because I just like finished with the Kellehers and that was a whole thing. Um, and then I discovered, you know, I knew I wanted to write about diamonds and advertising and all of that. And I discovered that the woman who wrote the line, a diamond is forever, was named Frances Garrity and came from this Irish family and her parents are Irish immigrants. And I was like, I can't escape the Irish. But um, I don't know if they'll appear in every book, but certainly <laughs> they are my, you know, that's, some, that's my source material that I seem to go back to again and again. Um, I've lived in New York for almost 15 years, and yet I keep writing about New England and Boston. And I think if I, if I moved back there, maybe I wouldn't write about it quite as much. But there's something about, like, sort of wanting to be in that place and sort of revisiting it through the books that is very appealing in a way. It's a safe distance. You, you and I talked a little bit about this because I have a similar, like, yeah. Oh, Massachusetts, I'll go back there someday. And then yeah. I'm like, what would the reality of that actually be like? There's something right. about the contemplating of it that, that you know, keeping it here. Yeah, there's um, always a pull to, toward yeah. where you came from. And at the same time, you're like, what is the safe boundary line where no one can knock on my door at eight in the morning without my expecting them? You know, New York is probably say, like just, sh just that. <laughs> yes. Actually, my question was about the engagements. Oh, I found good. It, I found it fascinating, and particularly the character that you just mentioned, who was sort Thank of the you. threshold character and provided sort of the bookends to the other stories that Thank were you. contained in the book. Um, I particularly liked at the end how you acknowledged the research mm. that you had done on this, and, and then actually you just sort of found almost towards the very end, I think it put off your publication date or yes. something like that yes. your manuscript to the publisher yeah and uh, you may you have already hinted at this but I wondered what stoked your interest in in the gate in the engagements yeah <laughs> well yeah so I, I guess I'm like a fairly obvious person so you know the last book I was sort of contemplating marriage and I wrote this book about all different kinds of marriages over the course of the 20th century and in the process I got engaged and I actually got married the week the book came out which was ridiculous and this time with the book about motherhood here I am and <laughs> I keep pitching my agent. I keep telling her I want to write a book about lottery winners because I feel like, <laughs> you know, might help me get there, but she doesn't seem interested. Um, so with the engagements, yes, I was writing this book about marriage. I knew that it was a book about four very different marriages that are connected by one diamond ring. And um, eventually I thought, well, I actually want to write more about diamonds and why they hold such power, what that means, what that symbol, where that came from. And so I started writing about um, the advertising team that created all of our modern attachment to diamonds through De Beers. And the character I was writing was a man because that was just sort of who I thought it would be. And then I was reading a book called The Heartless Stone by Tom Zollner, which is a great nonfiction book about diamonds. And there was just this one paragraph and it said, the line, a diamond is forever, was written by a woman named Frances Garrity and she never married. And I was like, what? That's incredible. So there really wasn't much written about Frances anywhere. And I decided to make her a character in the book. And kind of like as I did with this book where I just fell in love with the nuns and wanted to know everything about them, I really felt the same way about Francis. And I also felt like if I were to bring this real person, you know, kind of back to life in a novel, I wanted to be as truthful to who she was as I possibly could. And so I really approached her more with my journalist brain than novelist brain. I didn't want to write anything that wasn't true about her. Um, because don't you hate when you read a novel about a real person and you find out none of it was real? And you're like, well, why did you even write it about a real person? Um, but I had heard all this talk about the fact that there were these company memos that went back and forth every year between the ad agency and WR and De Beers. And I kept trying to find them. And I was on this wild goose chase for three years looking for them. Um, I came here because I was told they were at the Smithsonian. And there is an amazing collection of NWR stuff there, but not those memos. Um, so I kind of gave up on that, even though I thought they would be very juicy and interesting and really add to the story. And I think two days before the book was due to my publisher, it was done. But I had been trying to make a date with this woman who bought Frances Garrity's house in the 90s, um, just to go and just be in the house and just to experience what the rooms were like. And so um, we finally made this date for this particular day. And the book was done, but I went anyway. And we had a lovely time and we drank tea and it was great. Um, and just as I was leaving, this woman said, when Frances moved away, 
All she left behind in the house was this one box of work stuff, and I've never gotten rid of it. If you want it, you can have it. And it contained all the secret memos. <laughs> so yes, I had to tell my publisher, I'm going to need like another few weeks with this. <laughs> I'm going to need a minute. Yeah, I'm going to need a minute. Yeah. 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 We're going to have to hit pause. It was amazing. I didn't... Kind of a funny side story with that because I did get engaged while I was writing the book and I had by then decided, you know, I'm so kind of disgusted by the way that diamonds have been sold to us. I don't want a diamond. I'm special. I'm going to get a sapphire. So I got this sapphire. So after I looked at the memos, um, I got, you know, she gave me the memos. I drove away. I was definitely not driving back from Pennsylvania to New York without looking to, at the memos. So I only made it to like the first parking lot I found, which was like a Trader Joe's parking lot. And I was under these street lights and um, I opened up, the very first memo I opened was from the 50s. And it would have been written by Francis Garrity and it said, some women, some girls are going to think, especially ones who've gone to college, that they are just too smart for a diamond engagement ring. So try to sell them a sapphire flanked by diamonds on either side. <laughs> And I looked down, and I'm like, hmm, you got me, Francis. Good, good. She had you, she had you pinned. She did, yeah. she did. When you begin a novel, do you know how it's going to end? Good question. Um, in this, no, actually, do I ever? No, I don't think I ever have. Um, with this book in particular, it started really far away from where it ended up, much more so than my other books. Um, because, well, I don't know, actually. You know, it's like they say that you forget the pain of giving birth, so you'll do it again. I'm hoping that's true. And it's the same with a novel, where I think every time you're like, the last one was so straightforward, I'll do it again. But I think it isn't ever as straightforward as you remember. Um, with this book in particular, it was actually a completely different story for about a year and a half about that I was writing about this family. And um, it took me several hundred pages to realize that that story wasn't that interesting, but there was a little nugget of another story that I really should be writing within it. And so I got rid of many hundreds of pages and started from scratch. So I definitely didn't know in the beginning what the ending would be. I didn't even know what the beginning or middle would be. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up? And Jennifer signs all the book, or Courtney, sorry. I just looked at Jennifer in the back of the room. Hi, Jen. Um, <laughs> before you guys buy your books and Courtney signs them, does anybody else have a question? I have one last question. Um, someone asked earlier what, what some of your influences were. And I wonder, I think a lot of people have this idea of writers as people who aren't necessarily reading. But I wonder, as you yeah. were writing this novel, there was anything in particular you were reading or if there's anything you're reading like right now that you're really excited about yeah the one book that I or author I discovered when I was reading this book or writing this book um, who I simultaneously love and also she's the kind of writer who's so fabulous that you're just like I shouldn't be doing this I should be a travel agent why am I even here um, but her name is Anne Enright and she's an Irish writer she's fantastic if you have not read her books buy them today. I'm sure they <laughs> stock them here at PNP. Um, sure well, they do. Courtney, thank you so much for your time today. Thank it's you. Great this is so much fun. Thank you. Thanks.